Well, if you have your Bible, and I hope you do, let me invite you to open with me to Psalms chapter 19. I praise God for the men and women who have been pouring the Word of God into the hearts of these kids over the last few months. <laughs> you know, the tricky thing about teaching kids to memorize different scriptures is that you end up actually having to memorize them as well. And it increases, increases the responsibility in your own heart, in your own mind, in your own life. I was talking with one family who came up to me last Sunday, and uh, it was a five, six-year-old, and had just finished learning Psalms chapter 139, and so he quoted it to me, Psalm 139, and I won't say who it is, but I turned to his father and I said, and now you quote it as well? And he said, no, I'm not able to quote it. And it was really kind of funny to think about in order to, in order to know Scripture, in order to teach Scripture, we have to know Scripture. And I want you to see a non-negotiable in corporate worship tonight that I believe is foundational for all the non-negotiables we looked at. Just by way of review, we're going to have a little quiz next week, so be ready. We're looking at five different non-negotiables in corporate worship. I won't ask you what we've been through. This is kind of the review for the quiz next week. Three weeks ago, we started by looking at Nehemiah chapter 12, and we looked at the importance of community in worship, the fact that we're not just a bunch of individual believers gathered together for worship. We are a community of faith that comes together for worship corporately. So we talked about community. The week after that, we looked at humility. We looked at Revelation chapter 20, and we saw the radically God-centered nature of corporate worship. Everything revolves around His greatness. Then last week, we dove into the dialogue, conversation between Jesus and the woman at the well in John chapter 4, and we talked about honesty. We talked about the importance of coming before God honestly in our worship, in authenticity. So we've seen community and humility and honesty. Tonight, we're going to look at clarity. Clarity is probably, out of this whole series, the thing I'm most passionate about. It's the subject that I've spent the last seven years of my own life studying and teaching, the need for clarity in God's Word at the center of our worship, because I believe this is foundational for all the others. It, I had a couple of people call me just this last week from different, different churches, and they were talking about how, one was talking about how the pastor was not even bringing a Bible into the pulpit anymore. That he would stand up and give a 20-minute speech and never make even mention of the Word. I spent this, this spring traveling in different places almost every weekend up until Easter talking about the clarity, the need for clarity in God's Word. And so many people have come up and said, we are hungry for God's Word, but we're not, we're not diving into God's Word as a church in the settings that they were in. I was down in New Orleans preaching this last week, and somebody asked me, said, David, why are you so passionate about God's Word in our worship? If you ask that question of me, you're in for a long conversation. But ultimately, it all comes down to this. If God's Word is not central in our worship, then we are not worshiping. If God's Word is not at the center, at the focus of our worship, then we are not worshiping. And I want you to see that unfold in Psalm chapter 19. The foundational truth, kind of to set the stage for where we're headed tonight, what we're going to see in Psalm 19 is this. Worship involves a rhythm of revelation and response. Worship involves a rhythm of revelation and response. We're going to see this unfold, these two facets of worship in Psalm 19. The first part of what we see, we're going to talk about Revelation, and then we're going to see how response flows from Revelation. Psalm 19 is an incredible psalm. C.S. Lewis said it was his favorite of all the psalms. said the lyrical poetry here is incomparable anywhere else in the world. It is just an incredible picture here in Psalm chapter 19. And it's really a microcosm, kind of a condensed version of Psalm chapter 119, which is the longest chapter in the Bible that emphasizes the word over over and over and over again. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at Psalm 19 as the condensed version, and we're going to let that catapult us into Psalm 119, which we'll look at a little bit later on. So let's start in Psalm chapter 19, verse 1. Get the picture here. The heavens declare the glory of God, 
The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where the voice is not heard. Their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens he has pitched a tent for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming forth from his pavilion, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are sure and altogether righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the comb. By them is your servant warned, and keeping them there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then will I be blameless, innocent of great transgression. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight. O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Revelation and response. There is an interplay between these two things throughout the psalm. Think with me first about Revelation. In this psalm, it's talking about how God reveals himself in two primary ways, through two primary avenues. First of all, God reveals himself clearly through the world. He reveals himself clearly through the world. That's verses 1 through 6. Six. We get a picture of nature and how from the very beginning the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. The picture is of nature shouting of the greatness of God continually shouting of the greatness of God. And there is no place on this planet where nature is not shouting of the greatness of God. It's the same thing we see in Romans chapter 1, verse 18 through 20. It talks about since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse. Purpose of creation is to shout the glory of God. That's why in Luke chapter 19 it says, if we don't shout about the glory of God, who will do it for us? The rocks will cry out for us. That's the whole purpose of creation, to shout of the glory of God. And it's kind of divided in these first six verses into the skies proclaiming his greatness and then the sun. There's a focus on the sun, an incredible picture here of the sun rising on one side of the earth like a bridegroom coming from his pavilion. Bridegroom excited about his wedding rises and then it makes its circuit to the other side like a champion running its course. And there's no place on the face of this planet that is apart from its heat, that doesn't feel the heat of the sun in some way. This is the picture of how God has not, has not left his identity up in the air in all the world. He has shown who he is. The only problem is the way God reveals himself in the world is limited. Yes, God shows his power and his greatness through creation, but what the way this whole psalm is structured, when you get to verse 7, it's hitting a crescendo, and the psalmist David almost redoubles in his joy, and then he begins to talk about the law of the Lord and the precepts and the commands of the Lord. And what we see is that God reveal, has revealed himself clearly in the world, but second, God has revealed himself comprehensively, in other words, in an even greater way, in the Word. And what we see from verses 7 through 11 is a focus on God's revelation in his word and on the greatness of the word. What you see is different titles for the word. They're almost interchangeable. Law, statutes, precepts, commands, fear, ordinances. These different words that we see in the Old Testament to describe the word. Then after each of those titles, we see descriptions. The law is perfect. The statutes are trustworthy. We see all these different descriptions. And then we see the effects of the word, which we're going to get to in a second. But I want us to think about each of those phrases. There's six successive phrases, starting in verse 7, that talk about what the law of the Lord is. And I want you to see six attributes of the word. And they're attributes of the word we need to see because they go right in the face of much of our contemporary worship philosophy, contemporary worship trends. First of all, it says the law of the Lord is perfect. What that is saying is that the word is sufficient. This idea of the law of the Lord, the Torah, the instruction of the Lord being perfect, it's not just saying that it's without error, without flaw, which that's, that we know, 
What it's talking about, though, is that it's complete and it's comprehensive. It is all that God desires for it to be. God is not up in heaven thinking, I wish I would have added a 67th book to the Bible that would help people out in the 21st century. This is complete. This book is sufficient. It is all we need. This has been the cry. Saints throughout history, Puritans, in a time in England when it was illegal to have a copy of God's Word, and the authorities were threatening to take copies of God's Word away, and Puritan believers would rise up and say, take our houses, take our lands, take our churches, take our children, but don't take our Bibles. It's all we need. Is that the priority in our lives? Is that the priority in our worship, that the Bible, the Word of the living God, is all that we need? Because I'm concerned that in our worship, we have seen it necessary, maybe to use the Bible in our worship, but the Bible plus other things. We need the Bible plus some good practical tips from the preacher about how to deal with this or that. We need the Bible plus pop psychology. We need the Bible plus the world The Bible claims in and of itself to be sufficient. It is all we need. It is complete. It is perfect. The word is sufficient. Second, the word is relevant. The statutes of the Lord. Next phrase, the statutes of the Lord are trustworthy. This is David saying the statutes, the words of the Lord are a rock upon which everything in my life is based. Now it's at this point that we have had a tendency to think in our day, you know, The Bible is so far removed from the 21st century. Is it really applicable to us? There's a tendency to think, you know, you you preachers, you think everything is so simplistic. It goes back to the Word. You don't understand real life and the real struggles that I'm going through. Well, I won't pretend to understand all the struggles that are represented across this room, but I will say this. The Bible is a rock. It is a timeless rock, and it is, the Word is relevant I don't have to make the Bible relevant. I don't have to spice up the Word as some would say that I need to do. The Word is relevant. I simply show its relevance. It is a rock. David, who's writing this, think of all that he had been through. His struggles with sin, his struggles in marriage, his struggles with children. He had a a child who died. He had children who disobeyed him, rebelled against him. All the struggles, and he says in the middle of it, The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy. They are the rock upon which my life is based. The word is sufficient. The word is relevant. Third, the word is good. The precepts of the Lord are right. In other words, good. This is where where I would plead with you to put down the magazines and to put down the novels and to turn off the TV and to turn off Oprah and to Get off the internet and get into the Word of God because all of these things, no matter how much they help us in practical things, are simply the words of man. This is the Word of God. Ladies and gentlemen, the God of the universe who created all things, who knows you and me better than we know ourselves, who knows our family, who knows where all of eternity is headed toward, knows where all the future is headed toward, knows all that's going on in our culture, that God has chosen to speak to us. We are fools if we don't sit at His feet and listen to what He has to say. The Word is good because it is God's Word. He has spoken by His grace to us, and we need to listen. The Word is sufficient. The Word is relevant. The Word is good. Next, the Word is clear. The commands of the Lord, authoritative decrees that He gives are radiant. They bring light. They are clear. Man, what a corrective this is when one of those common questions we ask in the church today is, what is God's will for my life? Preacher, how do I know God's will for my life? I'm not pretending that this book will tell you exactly what career decision to make. It won't tell you exactly when to make this move or that move. It won't tell you exactly what to do in every single specific family situation. However, I am convinced that 95% of God's will for our lives is right here in this book. He has shown us his will. And I'm convinced that if we are faithful to give ourselves the 95% he has shown to us, maybe, just maybe, he would be faithful to show us the 5% that we don't know. 
God has not left us. This is good news. He's not left us to wander around in the fog of human opinion trying to find out who he is and how to lead our lives. He has shown us. He's given us his word, and it's clear. He's shown us his character over and over and over again. And we've got students that are memorizing. Did you hear that? Memorizing Nahum. Passages from Nahum about the clarity of God's character, whether it's his justice or his patience or his wrath or his love, his omniscience. He's clear. He's shown us who he is in his word. The word is sufficient, relevant, good, clear. The word is holy. The word is holy. This is one of my favorite parts of this chapter, verse 9. The fear of the Lord. We've seen the law, the statutes, the precepts, the commands, and now the fear of the Lord. That is a title that is given to this book. The fear of the Lord is pure. The Bible is described as the fear, the awe of the Lord. One of the things that I have heard in some contemporary discussions of worship is that if we put too much emphasis on the Word, then we will begin to worship the Word. And the question I want to ask based on Scripture is, is that a problem? Psalm chapter 56, verse 4, says, In God whose word I praise, in God will I trust. It says, I will praise the word of God. Psalm chapter 56, verse 10, In God whose word I praise, repeats the same phrase. You get over to Psalm chapter 119. Psalm chapter 119, which is the the development of Psalm 19, expanded. And it says, I love your law. It says, my flesh trembles in fear of you, and I stand in awe of your laws. I stand in awe of your laws. Get to Psalm chapter 138, verse 2. And that verse says that God has exalted above all things his name and his word. He puts his word on the same place plain that he puts his name in Psalm chapter 138, verse 2. Why? Because the Word is the revelation of who God is. It's why Jesus, when he came to the earth and was introduced in the book of John, it said in the beginning was the what? Word. Jesus is the Word. He is the revelation of God. This is the picture of the Word being holy and inciting fear in us, reverence and respect and awe for who he is. I don't think we're in danger of putting too much emphasis on the Word in our worship today. If we're going to err on any side, let's err on the side of taking God at His Word and putting it at the center of our worship. It is sufficient, relevant, good, clear, holy, and finally the Word is true. The ordinances of the Lord, this is a reference to His verdicts, His decrees, are sure, righteous, they are true. This is one of the reasons why the Word must be central in our worship because we live in a culture that is increasingly skeptical of truth and throwing out the idea that there is no absolute truth, no rock upon which we can, we can stand on, nothing we can know for sure. It's only true for you. What's true for you may not be true for me, and truth is all relative, and that's not what the Word claims. The Word claims to be sure and altogether righteous, altogether true. All of these are characteristics of the Word of God, sufficient, relevant, good, clear, holy, and true. Now, that's the titles and the descriptions, attributes of the Word of God. But what I want you to see is what happens after every single one of those descriptions. What we see is a result or an effect, the fruit of the Word. And so I want you to think we've seen revelation. Now let's think about response. What happens in response to God's Word? Well, in verse 7, it said, The law of the Lord is perfect. We saw there that the Word is sufficient. But look at the response, reviving the soul. Think about this effect of God's revelation. The Word transforms us. Reviving the soul, restoring the soul, refreshing the soul, transforming the soul. The picture of soul throughout the Old Testament, when this word is mentioned in the Hebrew, it's a picture of the whole person. And this verse is showing us that the law of the Lord is comprehensive, it is complete, it is sufficient. It is sufficient to restore us, revive us, transform our souls. We cannot grow into the image of Christ apart from God's word. That is why. Don't miss it. That is why we are destined, ladies and gentlemen, to live defeated Christian lives if we try to live it apart from God's Word. Because this is the avenue through which God transforms us. And if we try to live the Christian life apart from God's Word, then we will end up trying to meet all the rules and the regulations and do the right things, but it'll be empty because God is not transforming our soul through His Word. The only way we can have victory over sin is for God to transform our souls through His Word. 
what he does. So that's one effect. Second, the word makes us wise. That next phrase in verse 7, the statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. Wisdom all throughout Scripture is basically the application of God's word and God's will to daily living. That this book is enough to make us wise. That reminds you again that it's not this book plus the wisdom of the world that will make us wise. It's not this book plus Dr. Phil that's going to help us out. It's not this book plus this Christian book from the Christian bookstore that's going to help us out. The Word is enough to make us wise for godly living. We've got to believe this. We've got to see the claims the Word is making. It is able to make wise the simple, the simplest of us, It makes us wise if we trust in it. The Word makes us wise. Third, the Word satisfies us. Uh, The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. Fills our hearts with joy. That's what the Word claims to do. You get down at verse 10, it says, more precious than gold and much pure gold. Think about that with me. More precious than gold than much pure gold. More precious than than money. The psalmist here, it's almost like he has inherited millions of dollars, but it's just the word that he's got in his hands. What a, what a picture we need to see in our culture of materialism, where everything is aimed at more and more and more money and more and more and more comforts. You know, one of the tempting things when we hear children quoting Scripture like we've heard tonight quoting all over the Psalms and Isaiah, different verses. One of the tempting things is for us to sit here and think, I wish I had a young mind like that so I could memorize Scripture. I won't ask you to raise your hand, but how many of you may have thought that? You know, I I wish I was able to memorize like that. And and the real temptation is for us to walk out of here tonight and say, "I, I can't memorize Scripture And I want to say tonight that I believe that is a lie straight from the adversary. I won't pretend that all of us in this room have the exact same ability, capacity to memorize. I know that that may be different across this room. Let me ask you a question. What if I told you that between now and midnight tonight, I would give you $1,000 for every single verse you could memorize? How many of you could learn to memorize pretty quick? Could you do that? Yeah. Jesus wept, John eleven thirty five, 35, just like that, $1,000. It's that easy. God, help us not to be at a point in our Christianity where money would motivate us more than the value of God's Word would motivate us. The question is not can we memorize. The question is, is it valuable enough to fill our minds with? And that's the question we need to come face to face with whenever we start to think, I can't memorize. It's more precious than gold. Then it says sweeter than honey, honey from the comb. What a picture there. That doesn't seem to translate to our day. Let's translate it. More fulfilling than a great big porterhouse steak and a loaded baked potato to the side of it. This fills our souls in a much deeper way than that ever could. We are very, pretty regular when it comes to eating A few times a day, every day this week, most likely we will be eating. What if God's Word was the sustenance of our souls like that? Man does not live on bread alone, but on what? Every word that comes from the mouth of God. This is the sustenance for our soul, and it satisfies us. And just like we crave food even deeper, God help us to crave your word. It satisfies us. The word transforms us. It makes us wise. It satisfies us. The word enlightens us. The commands of the Lord are radiant. Here's the result, the response, giving light to the eyes in a world of darkness and confusion, in a world where there are many times where we find ourselves not knowing what to do, where to go. The Word is our light. The Word is a lamp to our feet and a what? And a light to our path. It enlightens us. Next, the Word awes us. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. We talked about how the Word is holy, how we stand in awe of God's laws. Do you remember Nehemiah chapter 8? If you were here a little over a year ago, we spent some time one morning looking at Nehemiah chapter 8, an incredible scene when, when Ezra the scribe comes out in front of the people of God. They had all assembled. He comes out with 
the book of the law, which is the first five books of the Old Testament at that point. And he opens up the book. All it says is Ezra opened the book in Nehemiah chapter 8. And here's what the people did. As soon as he opened the book, they all stood up. Everybody stood up. Just when the book was open, they stood up. They started raising their hands. They started shouting out, amen, amen. And then they bowed down with their faces to the ground. All because he opened the book. That's all he did. They stood up, raised their hands, shout out, and they bowed down with their faces to the ground. And the question we need to think about a couple of thousand years later is, in our worship, when do we normally respond like that? When do we stand? Maybe raise our hands, shout out. And maybe if we're really extreme, bow down with our faces to the crown, ground. We do that in response to what? In response to songs, in response to music. Now, is that a bad thing? No. Nehemiah chapter 12, we looked at that a few weeks ago. That's definitely not a bad thing. However, it does beg the question, what would happen if we were a kind of people who stood in awe of God's Word like that? What if it didn't take the strum of a, strum of a certain chord or a certain song to come on to cause us to rise up and to lift up our hands? What if all it took was the reading of God's Word, the opening of God's Word, to incite such reverence and awe in us that we rise to our feet, we lift up our hands, we shout out, amen, amen, and we may even bow down with our faces to the ground. God, make us a people who are awed by his word. The word awes us. And finally, the word makes us righteous. Ordinances of the Lord are sure and altogether righteous. And the picture, we don't have time tonight to dive into, but the picture that unfolds is how the psalmist David, he sees his sin in the law. The law exposes his sin, exposes his need for a redeemer. And what we see is the picture of the law making us righteous through the redemption that God provides. It is a picture of the king to come after David, Christ, who would fulfill the law perfectly, and he would redeem us from our sin, and he would make us righteous. The word makes us righteous. Now, we've got attributes of God here, revelation. We've got responses, effects of that revelation. Revelation and response. The word is sufficient, relevant, good, clear, holy, and true. It transforms us. It makes us wise. It satisfies us. It enlightens us. It awes us, and it makes us righteous. If those things are true, then why would we not want to put the word at the center of our worship? Why would we come to the contemporary worship trends that we have seen over the last few years in the church to discussions about how we can spice up the word in our worship, how we can use other means to make our worship more relevant to people. I'm convinced that what we have done in contemporary worship trends is we have taken this biblical picture of revelation and response and we have completely thrown revelation out the window. What happens is we come into our worship and we sing songs that are sung many times because of the way they sound and what they incite in us as opposed to the biblical or theological foundation at the root of them. And we've created a system where we put words up on a screen and we all sing them without even giving second thought to whether or not they're biblical, whether or not they square with the Word of God. And so we sing songs, and then it's all too common to come to a time where we study God's Word and maybe to, if you do, if we do bring a Bible up, we read a verse or two, and then we go into saying our thoughts, our opinions, our stories, the entertainment value of that, and maybe every once in a while come back to the Word, and at best, take the Word and help it support what we desire to say. And then at the end, we have response times in our worship, but the question we've got to ask is, at that point, what are we responding to? The danger is that we're responding to ourselves because we've minimized the revelation of God. We've got nothing left to respond to, and our worship has all of a sudden, suddenly become self-centered, hollow, and I'm convinced offensive to God if his revelation is minimized. And now the pressure's on. 
Now the pressure is on in corporate worship and those who lead in corporate worship. Every week, if the Word is going to be absent in our worship, then we've got to manufacture something Sunday morning in and Sunday morning out. And we've got to to live up to the pressure week by week of creating the emotions that we desire and creating the effects that we desire. When the Word is absent in our worship, all that's going to lead to is a manufactured response. And don't miss it with what we sing and what we say in our worship. We will will teach each other about God. But if His Word is not the center of our singing and His Word is not the center of our praying, if His Word is not the center of our preaching and worship, then what we will do is we will sing and pray and talk about God like we think He is. And we will give our thoughts and our opinions about who God is, and we will create God to be who we think He is, a God who thinks like us, who looks like us, who acts like us, a God who is a lot like us. And the danger there is when that happens, then when we come together for worship, we think we're worshiping God, but the reality is we're only worshiping ourselves. When the Word is absent in our worship, the response will only be manufactured, and the result will be pleasing to self. Stripping worship of the revelation of God and focusing on our response and thinking that God is most honored in that is a huge mistake. However, when the Word of God is at the center of our worship, when it's apparent in our worship, then the response is not manufactured. The response is authentic. And I would even say automatic. Here's the beauty of this whole picture. When God's revelation, when His Word is exposed, then response flows from that. And we don't have to manufacture anything because He is is, is leading the response. He is directing the response. And His Word, we've seen it over and over again in these different attributes and these different effects. It will transform us. It will satisfy us. It will make us wise. It will awe us. The Word will do the work for us if we let it. If we trust the Word to do the work for us. And the response will be the response will be authentic and the result will be pleasing to God. And we'll get to the end. And like the psalmist, we will say, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. As a result, if we want to experience true biblical worship, response to God in worship, then we must maximize his revelation. His word must saturate our worship. And this is where our worship will go so much deeper than we ever could have accomplished trying to do it through our own means. I mentioned that I was in New Orleans this last week, and some of you saw on the news that there was some flooding in New Orleans. Having lived there for five or six years, I knew, and if you are familiar with New Orleans, when it rains hard there, there is nowhere for that water to go but up. And so a buddy of mine and I got in our car on Friday morning, and we were driving, and it began to rain. It was not raining. It was just starting to rain when we got in the car, but it started to pour down rain. And all of a sudden, we saw the water on the roads beginning to rise more and more and more. And all of a sudden, we found ourselves engulfed in more and more and more water, and the water was starting to come up. It was up on the tires. We were driving through, making a wake wherever we were driving. And the dangerous thing about that whole driving situation in New Orleans at that point is you don't know. There's a lot of bumps in the road, so you don't know when, how how deep the water is at different places in the road. And so you can find yourself just all of a sudden immersed in in water. And we were almost to a friend's house, and we were about to take a left onto his street. And we couldn't tell how deep it was on that street. There were a couple of cars in front of us, so we kind of said to each other, it would really be nice if... One of these cars turned down that street and could help us out a little, show us the way. And so, fortunately for us, and not so fortunate for the guy in front of us, he was driving a conversion van, and he took a left down that street. And he got about 15 feet down the street, and all of a sudden, he goes down a little bit, and his conversion van is immersed in water, and it gets stuck. We take that as God's 
sign to us that we should not go down that street at this point. So we pull up on the median and just decide to wait things out there as this guy, his van is just sitting in the middle of a puddle of water that spans the entire street. And I saw that picture, thought about what we were studying. I couldn't help but to think, God, make us the kind of church that is so saturated with your word and our worship that it overwhelms us, that it overtakes us, that we get stuck in it every once in a while. Isn't it a good thing to get into the Word and to, to realize that there might be some places we go that we take some steps a little too deep and it takes us places where we may not have been ready to go, but we realize at that point that God is drawing us deeper into a knowledge of Him, deeper into His greatness, deeper into what it means to walk the Christian life. God help us to get stuck, saturated by His Word and our worship. Not to the point where it ruins us like it was ruining that guy's car, but to the point where it's a good thing or we're saturated with His Word. Do you want to know God? Do we want to know the God we worship? And are we willing to be a church that trusts God to do the work through his word in our worship? To relieve ourselves of the pressure to manufacture something week by week in corporate worship and simply to say, we're going to be clear about God's word and what we sing. We're going to be clear about God's word and what we pray. We're going to be clear about God's word and what we preach. And we're going to let God show his power through his word. I'm praying that God will use us as a faith family to show what happens when a people trust in his word. And we put the word at the center of our worship and it is supreme. I told a few different people this week that I am point in my life and ministry, and I believe we're at a point in our church where if he does not come through on his word, we will fall flat on our faces. But I've got to believe that God is honored in that. So the foundational question is this. Will we, as a faith family, will we ignore the word in our worship? Will we minimize it? Or will we let the word ignite our worship? Will it be the clarity, the foundation, which provides the framework for everything in our worship. I want you to turn me over to Psalm chapter 119. With that picture, revelation and response in your mind and your heart, I want us to look at Psalm 119. And I want us to see how the Word of God ignites the worship of God. And I want you to hear the heart of this psalmist, talking about all the words we've just seen, precepts, statutes, commands of the Lord, law of the Lord, and talking about its effect in his life, its effect in suffering, its effect in bringing joy and satisfaction and transforming him and awing him and making him righteous. I want you to see that unfold. Psalm 119, we mentioned earlier, pretty long chapter, and it's divided into different sections according to the Hebrew alphabet. I invite you to hear the heart of this psalmist and I pray that God would make us a people that stand in awe of his word. His word may it ignite our worship. Psalm chapter 119. Aleph. Blessed are they whose ways are blameless, who walk according to the law of the Lord. Blessed are they who keep his statutes and seek him with all their heart. They do nothing wrong. They walk in his ways. You have laid down precepts that are to be fully obeyed. All that my ways were steadfast in obeying your decrees, then I would not be put to shame when I consider all your commands. I will praise you with an upright heart as I learn your righteous laws. I will obey your decrees. Do not utterly forsake me. Bait, how can a young man keep his way pure? By living according to your word, I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Praise be to you, O Lord. Teach me your decrees. With my lips I recount all the laws that come from your mouth. I rejoice in following your statutes like one rejoices in great riches. I meditate on your precepts. I consider your ways. I delight in your decrees, and I will not neglect your word. 
Gimel, do good to your servant, and I will live. I will obey your word. Open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your law. I am a stranger on earth. Do not hide your commands from me. My soul is consumed with longing for your laws at all times. You rebuke the arrogant who are cursed and who stray from your commands. Remove from me scorn and contempt that I may keep your statutes. Though rulers sit together and slander me, your servant will meditate on your decrees. Your statutes are my delight. They are my counselors. Dalit, I am laid low in the dust. Preserve my life according to your word. I recounted my ways, and you answered me. Teach me your decrees. Let me understand the teaching of your precepts, then I will meditate on your wonders. My soul is weary with sorrow. Strengthen me according to your words. Keep me from deceitful ways. Be gracious to me through your law. I have chosen the way of truth. I have set my heart on your laws. I hold fast to your statutes, O Lord. Do not let me be put to shame. I run in the path of your commands, for you have set my heart free. Hey, teach me, Lord, to follow your decrees, then I will keep them to the end. Give me understanding, and I will keep your law and obey it with all my heart. Direct me in the path of your commands, for there I find delight. Turn my heart toward your statutes and not toward selfish gain. Turn my eyes away from worthless things. Preserve my life according to your word. Fulfill your promise to your servants so that you may be feared. Take away the disgrace I dread, for your laws are good. How I long for your precepts. Preserve my life in your righteousness. Vav, may your unfailing love come to me, O Lord, your salvation according to your promise. Then I will answer the one who taunts me, for I trust in your word. Do not snatch the word of truth from my mouth, for I put my hope in your law. I will always obey your law forever and ever. I will walk about in freedom, for I have sought out your precepts. I will speak of your statutes before kings and will not be put to shame, for I delight in your commands because I love them. I lift up my hands to your commands, which I love, and I meditate on your decrees. Zion, remember your word to your servant, for you have given me hope. My comfort in my suffering is this. Your promise preserves my life. The arrogant mock me without restraint, but I do not turn from your law. I remember your ancient laws, O Lord, and I find comfort in them. Indignation grips me because of the wicked who have forsaken your law. Your decree is the theme of my song wherever I lodge. In the night I remember your name, O Lord, and I will keep your law. This has been my practice. I obey your precepts. Hey, you're my portion, O Lord. I have promised to obey your words. I have sought your face with all my heart. Be gracious to me according to your promise. I have considered my ways and have turned my steps to your statutes. I will hasten and not delay to obey your commands. Though the wicked bind me with ropes, I will not forget your law. At midnight, I rise to give you thanks for your righteous laws. I'm a friend to all who fear you, to all who follow your precepts. The earth is filled with your love, O Lord. Teach me your decrees. Tate, do good to your servant according to your word, O Lord. Teach me knowledge and good judgment, for I believe in your commands. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I obey your word. You are good, and what you do is good. Teach me your decrees. Though the arrogant have smeared me with lies, I keep your precepts with all my heart. Their hearts are callous and unfeeling, but I delight in your law. It was good. For me to be afflicted so that I might learn your decrees. The law from your mouth is more precious to me than thousands of pieces of silver and gold. You owed your hands, made me, informed me. Give me understanding to learn your commands. May those who fear you rejoice when they see me, for I have put my hope in your word. I know, O Lord, that your laws are righteous, and in faithfulness you have afflicted me. May your unfailing love be my comfort according to your promise to your servant. Let your compassion come to me that I may live for your law is my delight. May the arrogant be put to shame for wrong me without cause, but I will meditate on your precepts. May my heart be, may those who fear you turn to me, those who understand your statutes, may my heart be blameless toward your decrees that I may not be put to shame. Cough, I call with all my heart. Answer me, O Lord, and I will obey your decrees. My soul faints with longing for your salvation. But I have put my hope in your word. My eyes fail. Looking for your promise, I say, when will you comfort me? Though I am like a wineskin in the smoke, I do not forget your decrees. How long must your servant wait? When will you punish my persecutors? The arrogant dig pitfalls from me, contrary to your law. All your commands are trustworthy. Help me, for men persecute me without cause. They almost wipe me from the earth, but I have not forsaken your precepts. Preserve my life according to your love, and I will obey the statutes of your mouth. Lama, your word, O Lord, is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. Your faithfulness continues through all generations. You established the earth, and it endures. Your laws endure to this day, for all things serve you. If your law had not been my delight, I would have perished in my affliction. I will never forget your precepts, for by them you have preserved my life. Save me, for I am yours. I sought out your precepts. The wicked are waiting to destroy me, but I will ponder your statutes. To all perfection, I see a limit, but your commands are boundless. Ma'am, that's why I say, oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it all day long. Your commands make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever with me. 
I have more insight than all my teachers, for I meditate on your statutes. I have more understanding than the elders, for I obey your precepts. I have kept my feet from every evil path, so that I will obey your word. I have not departed from your law, for you yourself have taught me. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. I gain understanding from your precepts. Therefore, I hate every wrong path. Noon, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path. I have taken an oath and confirmed it that I will follow your righteous laws. I've suffered much. Preserve my life, O Lord, according to your word. Accept, O Lord, the willing praise of my mouth and teach me your laws. Though I constantly take my life in my hands, I will not forget your laws. The wicked have set a snare for me, but I have not strayed from your precepts. Your statutes are my heritage forever. They are the joy of my heart, and my heart is set on keeping your decrees to the very end. Samach, I hate double mighty men, but I love your law. You are my refuge and my shield, and I have put my hope in your word. So away from me, you evildoers, that I may keep the commands of God. Sustain me according to your promise, and I will live. Do not let my hopes be dashed. Uphold me, and I will be delivered. I will always have regard for your decrees. You reject all who stray from your decrees, for their deceitfulness is in vain. All the wicked of the earth you discard like dross. Therefore, my flesh trembles in fear of you. I stand in awe of your laws. I and I have done what is righteous and just. Do not leave me to my oppressors. Ensure your servants will bring. Let not the arrogant oppress me. My eyes fail, looking for your salvation, looking for your righteous promise. Deal with your servant according to your love and teach me your decrees. I am your servant. Give me discernment that I may understand your statutes. It's time for you to act, O Lord, for your law is being broken. Because I love your commands more than gold, more than pure gold, and because I consider all your precepts right, I hate every wrong path. Pay, your statutes are wonderful. Therefore, I obey them. The unfolding of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. I obey open my mouth and I pant, longing for your commands. Turn to me and have mercy on me as you always do to those who love your name. Direct my footsteps according to your word. Let no sin rule over me. Redeem me from the oppression of men so that I may obey your precepts. Make your face shine upon your servant and teach me your decrees. Streams of tears flow from my eyes for your law is not obeyed. Tzade, righteous are you, Lord, and your laws are right. The statutes you have laid down are righteous. They are fully trustworthy. My zeal wears me out, for my enemies ignore your words. Your promises, though, have been thoroughly tested, and your servant loves them. Though I am lowly and despised, I will not forget your laws. Your righteousness is everlasting, and your law is true. Trouble and distress have come upon me, but your commands are my delight. Your statutes are forever right. Give me understanding that I may live. Cough, I call with all my heart. Answer me, O Lord, and I will obey your decrees. I call out to you, save me, and I will keep your statutes. I rise before dawn and cry for help, for I put my hope in your word. My eyes stay open through the watches of the night so that I may meditate on your promises. Hear my voice in accordance with your love. Preserve my life, O Lord, according to your law. Those who devise wicked schemes are near, but they are far from your law. Yet you are near, O God, and all your commands are true. Long ago I learned from your statutes that you established them to last forever. Raish, look upon my suffering and, and deliver me, for I have not forgotten your, your law. Defend my cause and redeem me. Preserve my life according to your promise. Salvation is far from the wicked, for they do not seek out your decrees. Your compassion, though, is great, O Lord. Preserve my life according to your laws. Many are the foes who persecute me, but I have not turned from your statutes. I look on the faithless with loathing, for they do not obey your word. See how I love your precepts. Preserve my life according to your love. All your words are true. All your righteous laws are eternal. Seen and sheen. Rulers, persecute me without cause. But my heart doesn't tremble at them. My heart trembles at your word. I rejoice in your promise like one who finds great spoil. I hate and abhor falsehood, but I love your law. Seven times a day I praise you for your righteous laws. Great peace have they who love your law, and nothing can make them stumble. I wait for your salvation, O Lord, and I follow your commands. I obey your statutes, for I love them greatly. I obey your precepts and your statutes, for all my ways are known to you. Tough. And may this be the cry of the church today in our worship. May our cry come before you, O Lord. Give us understanding according to your word. May our supplication come before you. Deliver us according to your promise. May our lips overflow with praise, for you have taught us your decrees. May our tongues sing of your word for all your commands hands are righteous, and may your hand be ready to help us, for we have chosen your precepts. We long for your salvation, O Lord, and your law is our delight. Let us be a church that lives so that we can praise you, and may your laws be our sustenance. We have strayed like lost sheep. 
God, forgive us in the church today. We have strayed like lost sheep from the primacy of your word. We say today, seek your servants, for we have not and we will not be a church that forgets your commands. God, help us to see that the word is good. And the word does the work. God, make us a people who trust in that, who believe that. And as a result, make us a people who cry for the word in our worship. Who say we don't want entertainment, we don't want stories, we don't want this and that. We want to know God. We want to see his glory. We want to magnify his greatness. We want to be transformed. We want our souls to be revived. We want to be restored into the image of Christ. We want to be satisfied in a way that nothing in this world could ever satisfy us, and only his word can do that. We want to be in awe of it. God, make us a people to tremble at his voice, and that flows into singing of his greatness, revelation, and response. Let's sing together.